Hey there, everybody. I hope you're um, all safe and well at home. This is Mr. Dowling. I'm going to take you on a whistle stop tour of A level English literature and why you should study it. At the moment, we're looking at uh, a picture. It's a wander above the sea of fog, um, painted in 1818. Um, <clears throat> quite a significant time, really, for uh, the development of art and literature. And uh, I think this picture for me shows or sums up why analysing literature and why studying literature can help you experience life and look at life in a different way. The beauty of the self, the beauty of nature, the beauty of heaven, the beauty of earth and the, um, just how shocking and wonderful an ex uh, the experience can be. English literature is a subject of reading and one of the reasons why we love to read is because we get to put ourselves in somebody else's shoes. We get to experience things from somebody else's point of view and sometimes we can criticise um, what a character has done or what they have experienced or sometimes we can connect with it at an emotional level and if you are like me there's nothing better than just being able to sit down and literally lose myself in a completely different world but then close the book and be able to apply the things that I've learned, the things that I felt in my own life. And I suppose for me, from studying literature and from uh, reading so many novels, sometimes it's about giving words to emotions or things that I have been through in my life, which I suppose I may not have decided to express without the help of sometimes reading it I suppose and being able to talk about it. Now what is literature? Now literature of course is books okay and um, it's about um, the it's about how people have managed to put down on paper what's been going on around them um, and how we can sometimes challenge what we see, challenge the way that things um, happen in life, challenge governments, challenge decisions. Literature is all about challenging um, and I think this picture here for example really sums up what literature tries to do and it's a way of being outside of a situation. So literature is about being able to understand what's going on in the world and as I said before it's about taking a step back and really having a think about what in literature we tend to discover some of the darker and um, more dangerous sides of our personalities not only as in individuals but as people and here's a great still from a film called the seventh seal and you've got death on the left and on the right is uh, the hero is the knight and the knight is playing death at chess and this is because as humans we are um, as when we get to a certain age, we become aware that life ends and that there is essentially we die. And that's quite a unique thing um, among, um, in the animal kingdom to know that you are inevitably going to die. And so death drives an awful lot of literature and it's extremely interesting. It gives us an awareness of life, um, it gives us a maturity, it heightens our senses. And so one of the big driving themes throughout most of the work that we look at is this notion of um, of life really and of living and how great it is but also the um, uh, the, the world beyond life as well and, um, and beyond death. Another um, theme that we look at it often tends to be our desire and our greed and power and the um and how we tend to latch onto power how we maintain power and how control is used and that doesn't just have to be like in this image in a sort of religious context where you can see um satan here who's uh, just devouring human beings in his sort of ultimate goal and search for um for ultimate power um it can also be um, about how um, social institutions hold power over us. For example, um, uh, political or social economic institutions and uh, religious institutions and how as humans we can sometimes feel as though we are um, trapped and controlled. And also within that 
um, sense control, we look at the notion of freedom as well, its counterpart. And so um, power and freedom is often looked at in a sense. So these are quite mature things that we like to discover and talk about in English literature. This leads us on to one of our more mature themes. You're getting older and so you're discovering that um, desire and arousal and sex is part of um, a part of growing up and it's also a part of literature. Um, many theorists believe that sex is something that drives human behaviour, day-to-day human behaviour and even invades sort of all of our um, simplest decisions or more complex decisions I suppose that we make in life and a lot of these things can be, um, a lot of these things can be uh, taken back to our sort of uh, base uh, uh, sexual needs and these are things that we need to discover within text because we see it all around us even just within the TV programs that we watch whether it be a soap opera or whether it be an advert on TV so the things that we discuss um, to do with like we we're saying before wealth and power um, we also bring in more darker and mature themes um, such as sex so how does this fit in with everything else that's going on in the world? So in order to understand the text, in order to um, <coughs> draw out its deeper meanings and look at why it was written, how it was written, what exactly is it fighting against or what is it fighting for? Um, we need to have a look at the history of it, the context, um, what was going on in society at the time. Um, and that's why literature fits so well with other um, uh, humanities and social sciences as well as an A-level because um, you get to look at um, the historical culture and look at philosophy behind it and the behaviours of people at the time and the social structures and how this all fits together. Um, it also um, looks at how it shapes us as people, um, who we are, why we're here, um, trying to unlock the experience of um, of other people to empathise with how others feel and just give us a language and capability to express ourselves and inspire us to travel, to, to live and get out there and be unique, reckless, thoughtful and become intelligent human beings, I suppose. Um, and it's about how you will experience the world. Um, and if you've never left Birmingham or uh, you've never read a book about life outside your own comfort zone, then uh, then this is it. And this is for you. This is to literally take you somewhere that you've never been before, um, even if it's just traveling within mind. And so ways that we do that is we bring um, methods and they're actually sometimes known as critical lenses, OK, um, different critical lenses which we apply to texts. And some of it you may have seen already in your GCSE study. So we have um, Marxist literary criticism looking at power structures and we have uh, feminist literary criticism looking at how uh, females are presented um, in um, in literature across uh, different eras and different ages, gender representations and equality within gender um, and the reader response sort of like how does the way uh, how how what the writer's intention is, how that can differ from what the reader interprets it as. And then sometimes we look at the psychological um, avenues. So, for example, going back in here, you've already looked um, at Animal Farm. You've looked at the ideas of communism and Marxism and Karl Marx. And so <clears throat> um, we will be applying that theory to texts and seeing, well, who's got the power of production? Who's um, <clears throat> what? How's the social structure or the political structure or the economic structure set to uh, benefit or sometimes uh, disadvantage the characters within text? Is this a window into what the people were experiencing at the time the text was written? Or could it possibly be a warning of what is to come in the future? Um, we look at different waves of feminism. We look at feminism when it when it uh, when it was first um, uh, when it first came to light as a major literary uh, theory, and um, we look at how that's changed over the years with different texts. So, for example, a like a proto feminist, um, so like a, an early beginning. Um, a writer from the Victorian era with feminism, how that might differ to um, 
uh, feminists who were writing, say, in the 70s and 80s, and then when feminism became really popular, especially among colleges and universities, and looking at um, uh, new waves of feminism today, and looking at how um, feminism isn't all just about um, isn't all just about girl power. It's uh, it's also about analysing how uh, men are represented within texts as well. So it's dispelling some myths, but implying uh, applying some different ways of thinking about texts, which allows us to unlock a deeper meaning. And once again, is the writer trying to give us a picture of what life was like back then, or is it a warning shot? Um, another lens we look at psychoanalysis. Um, we look at how uh, the theories of the mind and we apply how um, we can take some Freudian theories um, and once again apply them um, to a text and see if there are, um, are some psychological ulterior motives behind how characters act respond or react to certain things, why they make certain decisions. Um, we also look at, we psychoanalyze the writers themselves and think, well, what's their backstory? And how has that influenced the way that they've written? Are the decisions they've made whilst writing been um, conscious, subconscious? Um, <coughs> uh, when writing these things like, um, conscious decisions to possibly only have male characters, uh, conscious or subconscious decisions between having um, a certain characters, certain heroes and certain villains. So once again, we're adding more into this melting pot so we can just keep delving deeper and deeper into text and get out uh, and get out meanings. So what are you going to study when you come into A-level? How, what books are you going to apply these new and wonderful theories to? So you have to do a Shakespeare because Shakespeare is one of the most incredible things that's happened to the planet um, and one the tech we study many different types of uh, Shakespeare texts that you can study but um, uh, one that's most recently been taught is Hamlet and Hamlet is known as one of the big guns of Shakespeare and we have some of the greatest quotes um, that's ever, uh, that have ever been written uh, there are more things um, in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy or the very famous to be or not to be that's the question to die to sleep, to sleep perchance to dream I, there's the rub. For in this sleep of death what dreams may come. And to thine own self be true. Literally everything that Shakespeare ever wrote was <clears throat> was incredible and we get to have a um that's so that's one section it's our opening section of our of our course and it's within uh, the first year and you also study in the second year and i'll talk to you more about the course breakdown in a moment we also study poetry so not just shakespearean plays we move on and we study poetry as well and uh one one poet we study often at a level is christina rossetti um who's a, a famous female victorian poet um and she's well most famous for writing um the goblin market which is a epic children's poem about sacrifice about two sisters who come across some goblins in the forest and then um <clears throat> and uh one of them tastes the fruit of the goblins and then becomes addicted to the taste of the fruit and then we have a look at how this unfolds into a childish nightmare one of the greatest uh, uh fairy tales I suppose ever told um, so we, in poetry, we have a look at um, uh, we have a look at how poetry is put together. So we look more at the mechanics of it. So we have the form, the meter, and you have um, you have touched upon these in your GCSE as well. Um, but we look at different types of poetry: ballads, dramatic uh, monologues, and lyrics, for example. And we also really get to grips with how poetry is put together. It's meter, okay? So is it written in, in by iambic pentameter or iambic, for example? Um, we look at the different stresses and how that can change the meaning of the lines for example and um, as uh, having gone uh, having gone through studying uh, literature at GCSE um, you'll know that there's lots of annotations this is one of my favorite things to do uh, to really to annotate poetry so there's going to be um, a, a lot of close analysis um, for those of you out there who really enjoy close analysis of text and stories and characters and stuff like that um, it's a possibility you could study John Milton uh, John Milton's Paradise Lost uh, pretty much considered one of the greatest greatest uh poems to have ever been written and um, it's, it's another epic poem it's uh, it's huge it spans so many different books biblical story of the fallen man uh, about the temptation of adam and eve um by the fallen angel satan as a snake um 
and how they were excluded or uh, the expulsion from the Garden of Eden. And you look at Milton's purpose behind it um, and you look at the writer's um, purposes behind why they were writing it. So um, sometimes it's stated that Milton wrote um, uh, Paradise Lost to justify the ways of God um, to men. So we look at what the intention and purpose was behind some of these greatest um, work of literature. Um, we also um, we also have a Gothic element where we look at the creation of monsters among Gothic romance. Um, and uh, one of the novels that we often study is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, once again written in 1818, the same time as the um, same time as the picture from the very beginning of uh, of the show. And uh, Mary Shelley, a very young girl at the time uh, of writing it, um, and you will learn about the backstory between uh, a backstory in how Frankenstein was written, um, how, almost like the birth of the monster, how it came to be, and the legendary story of um, how uh, of of a bet that was made between her husband uh, Percy Shelley, who wrote Ozymandias, and their friend Lord Byron, and um, <clears throat> and Mary Shelley as they were staying as they were staying together, and, and a bet who could write the greatest. Um, horror story and um, she was only about 17, 18 at the time um, and then she wrote this wonderful novel about a doctor who wants to um, who wants to have the same power as God I suppose who wants to be able to um, harness the power of uh, of a superior being be able to create life um, <clears throat> and so um, we look at, um, as always, something goes wrong. And so we look at the uh, the nature between man and monster and our close relationship with nature itself. Um, we also study um, more modern forms of Gothic horror and horror itself. So we also look at Bloody Chamber. This is written by a woman called Angela, Curt uh, Angela Carter. And uh, she's also known as a second wave feminist. So she was writing in the 70s and 80s. And a lot of her work, um, especially within the Bloody Chamber, often um, subverts our traditional ideas about things. Um, so the Bloody Chamber, for example, is, um, is a story um, is a, and, and, and a collection of fairy tales. And often they have a gothic, sinister um, twist uh, where quite often instead of the man being the hero um, quite often we see the uh, or the females within the story um, we quite often see how they subvert their vulnerable um, typical uh, stereotypical roles and how they can become the heroines of the story and uh, um, and it's very gory and uh, full of death and it's um, it, it's based on bringing out the darker nature of fairy tales. Um, so typical content in these, they're, 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 it's, it's very mature and uh, we, so we see death, power, desire, sex, jealousy, torture, um, also some things which are quite difficult um, to uh, to talk about, I suppose, taboos within normal uh, society. So uh, necrophilia, be, uh, uh, bestiality um, and paedophilia, etc. Uh, it does touch upon some uh, very difficult um, uh, very difficult subjects okay and the language used within it as well uh, can also be quite uh, quite dark and sexual in nature as well it's on, on there for you um, we also um, study uh, more uh, we also study plays um, so for an example um, I've taught um, Henrik Ibsen's um, A Doll's House um, which is a uh, very famous uh, play about um, a woman called Nora and her husband and how um, she transforms from being a sort of what you could argue as a, tra a trapped um, uh, powerless female within the domestic setting and how she manages to escape um, that birdcage or that doll's house for example. Um, that's a Norwegian play um, and uh, I think that's written uh, more or less, uh, sort of late 1800s and um, we look at how um, themes within these texts that we've looked at actually uh, link and uh, between one another so for example with a doll's house um, you, we look at how that relates to the Rossetti poetry from earlier and how um, writers from uh, completely different standpoints with completely different purposes um, can still explore the same themes in different ways and come out with similar or completely different results and it's, it's, it is wonderful. Um, 
as uh, as being part of an English literature course, um, you do also have the um, the luxury of writing coursework. And with our coursework element, you have uh, you can choose three texts, um, and there will be some texts um, that you are. Um, Exp uh, you're expected to choose yourself um, and you can choose your own question so you can set your own question to analyze and then you have to write um, two uh, small essays um, and submit it in year 13. So there's a coursework element of it and um, it's quite often one of the most fun parts of the course because it really allows you to do what you want to do. It's a very independent and individual so one of the great things about studying English literature, especially at Cash, is that you get your texts. Uh, we buy your text for you and we make sure that you've got um, uh, York notes or we make sure you've got study guides that go alongside as well to help you with your study, to help you do well in your course. So why study A-level English literature? Um, so it links to uh, <clears throat> many degrees it's known English literature is known as a facilitating subject so it's something that's respected by uh, most universities and the top universities or the Russell Group universities it's known as a rigorous academic subject and it leads on to um, to many many degrees it's a wonderful subject to have alongside sciences as well because it teaches you so much about how to write and how to argue and how to present an essay or a thesis. So many of your uh, what you could, what you would guess like English literature and English language, um, but there's journalism, there's law, and there's film, and there's media, and there's history, philosophy. There's so many degrees, and there are a million different jobs that you can do um, with an A level in English literature and going on further on to a degree. Um, and I mean, a list lists, for example, are restricted by nature if you if you know you're never going to be defined by a few subjects that you choose and you know never be pigeonholed by it but there are plenty of things you can do i have friends who have gone on to be directors um in film and in theater um in english um <clears throat> my uh what my best friend um uh who did a degree in literature and film at cardiff now runs his own national magazine and his own festival um, and a collection of pubs across the country. So it's amazing the places you can go with literature. Um, so one of the great things about studying here at Cash, our online resources are used worldwide. So our, our Cash online resources are used by many teachers across um, across the world in order to teach A-level because um, the provision that we've got here is is pretty world class really. Um, you, we take you to the theatre. We have some uh, we have some fab trips to universities, and we get to um, experience English literature within the university setting as well. Um, everything we teach at A level English literature is university level. Um, we never try and uh, dumb anything down. You do get um, a, universe, a university level world class. Um, experience of English literature here. Um, your vocabulary will become more sophisticated, you'll become a much better essay writer, which is useful for every single degree um, that you can study. Um, we have the best teachers ever, we're a bit extremely highly qualified. A lot of us have um, who teach A-level English literature have been to um, Russell Group universities ourselves or have firsts and masters in, in, our, in our subject or in education, so you really are in um, you're in great hands, um, basically. Um, we also get excellent results. Um, uh, all of our students do well. Um, and uh, many of our students have gone on to um, study at the top universities as well. It, this is a subject for you. It's a subject for your thoughts, your freedom of thought and your interpretations. It's a place where you can be safe and free to say what you want and for you to explore different ideas, um, either as an individual or as a, as a group. Um, it, we always become a tight-knit group by the end, and we always become good friends. Um, and so that's what makes it such a, a safe place to study and such a lovely subject to study as well. And it is fun. It is very fun. Um, it's about your personal growth. It's about developing you. Um, so essentially, you know, choose to study English literature, okay? Choose life, okay? Choose English literature and oh the places you'll go. Uh, thank you very much for listening and hope to see you next year.